we do it. And congratulations on a fabulous movie. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm just wondering, is there going to be any uh, follow-up to this movie to follow the story of the characters? Because their uh, stories are so rich and representative of what's happening around the world. And maybe um, there could be more uh, about uh, climate action and how um, for, for every action that we do, we uh, get 10 times back more in return. You know, and that that message should be uh, brought forward in any subsequent documentaries. And uh, once again, congratulations. So, I'm just wondering, would that be a question for you, Nicholas? Um, uh, a follow-up. Um, <laughs> another movie. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll start by saying this one took us uh, four years to make, <laughs> and we had a, a, a a little pandemic in the middle, um, uh, many times lost our funding, rose again from a, a, like a phoenix from the ashes, and um, uh, I, you know, I, I would love to, I, well, what I can say is that uh, we remain a family, the, the group. Um, uh, I've been in touch recently with most uh, everyone, um, Greg Asner and Robin Martin are really delving very deep into the, the, the process of helping the indigenous communities in Hawaii, uh, also now in Cuba and other places where they've really seen that science and indigenous uh, uh, knowledge overlaps. And that's been encouraging because they've made that into law. There's, there's now a, a marine, there's a, a new category of marine protected area based upon indigenous, both indigenous supervision and policing. And, in, and indigenous um, uh, rights. Um, Aruna is going to college and he will do great things. He's studying philosophy. Um, uh, we had conversations about Kant and Nietzsche, which is great. Um, and uh, Redima goes from strength to strength. I think uh, she's always going to be someone to watch. She does not go on school strikes because that's not what you do in, in India. Um, where school is too valued, uh, but she's finding her own ways to make waves, and um, uh, you know I, I watch watch her in the space. Um, and Chief Data has um, been elected locally to become a healthcare representative. So not only is he is an, an indigenous leader, but he's uniting the issue of environment and healthcare for his people throughout the Amazon region. Um, and he's becoming quite famous. I think he's a good statesman and uh, with a new, freshly elected uh, new government in Brazil, hopefully he will have further to go. So yes, I mean, uh, that's the verbal version of what's happening and uh, I would love to say that we, we, we'd uh, be able to cover that in film, maybe visit this again in a few years. Um, it's a brilliant idea, so thank you. That's great. It's great to get an update even of that much. So thank you very much. Anybody else with a read down here? James? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I feel very moved by the movie. Um, uh, just thinking about some of the news I heard today. Uh, was a, an item on the radio about jet planes um, and the realization has just occurred in the last couple of years that jet planes are much worse in terms of their emissions than we have previously realized and uh, yet uh, when you talk to Aer Lingus or Ryanair their plans are for massive expansion um, there's another item to the effect that uh, it was a survey of people's attitudes and understanding of climate change in Ireland. And while there were some encouraging signs in it, there was still a very high level of lack of understanding of what climate change is about. Or a better term for me is the climate crisis, climate breakdown. And um, I, I sometimes despair that no matter how much information people have, we still carry on. And I'm reminded of the, the movie Don't Look Up, if anyone has seen it. It's, 
it's this kind of jokey movie about an asteroid coming towards the Earth and nobody sees it. None of the important people who can take action actually acknowledge it. And to me, that's what's happening here, is, is the asteroid is heading towards the Earth that nobody's looking up, uh, apart from a few souls trying to do something. Um, so, what I'm coming around to is, is this kind of initiative is, to me, critically important. It's about communication, it's about information. So, it leads me on to my question, what's going to happen to this, you know, it's, following on a bit from what Pat says, uh, it's not so much about what the next movie movie is going to be, but what is going to happen to this movie? How is this going to be distributed? Thank you. I think that's for Lorna. Yeah. Well, Nicholas could take it, but I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so this film is free to view on YouTube, so everybody can watch it, can share it, um, can organise local screenings and that's the big kind of push that um, we have those trokras very much behind the, the campaign in Ireland for community screenings so we want, want to get it, get it watched by as many people and preferably in this kind of context where we can have a discussion and raise such important issues because they, those are the issues, that, issues of our time. The other thing is that it can be broadcast um, and many broadcasters, public broadcasters, have taken the film for public broadcast because it's got such critical information in it. PBS, the broadcaster in the US, has taken it. Unfortunately, RTE have chosen not to take the film. So if that upsets you or you want them to, <laughs> we might start a little campaign tonight and you could, everybody could write to RT and say, we saw this film and we think it's worthy of being shown on RT TV. I personally, obviously I've got vested interest here in terms of, uh, I know all the characters and I feel like they're my family um, and I want their stories to be heard because this is, these are such important stories. And I think, um, yeah, the other point you raise about the sense of despair, and I think that's another reason why this film needs to be shown as well, because even though it's the truth hurts, and that's to me being part of the making of it, it was like real wake up to, to the truth of the situation. You can't deny it if someone's sitting in front of you and their school's underwater. Um, so it's, it, but, and yet, there was, there's hope comes through this film and part of that hope to me for whether whatever religion or faith or no faith but it's that belief that, that there's, a, there's a reason why we're here, we have a deeper purpose as a species and that this is our moment to be called to that deeper purpose and to, to change our lives. I mean I, I was very struck in the, by um, Canto La Mesa very quiet, that, the old, the cardinal uh, uh, who speaks so quietly in, in the film and just that line that's almost like a giveaway line, he says, I've experienced this in my life, the joy of owning nothing and enjoying everything. I was like, and he radiates that, so it, there's something for everybody in there, I think, and it gives hope, it really gives hope that we can change. And I think what, what impressed me very definitely was the invitation to relate to the people at the front line, which is what made you feel like family. And I think that's how we feel. And I want to bring Martin in on this one, because he, he mentioned relating to the earth and coming back to that sense of the sacredness. So Martin, would you like to say a couple of things about that? Sure. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, I think... <laughs> One of the great problems, I've worked with the environmental movements for uh, now almost 50 years and 40 years working with all major religions. And most of the language that we use in the environmental movement about our relationship with nature is outside of nature. We're observers of it. We stand apart from it. We manage it. The one critical comment I would have of Nicholas is that the indigenous peoples are not stewards of their land. That's a Western concept. They're in relationship with it. And they're in a sacramental, sacred relationship with it. 
in the Orthodox Church, which was the first church that issued a major statement on the environment in 1989. The Catholic Church is very, very late to the party. Every other major faith has done far more in terms of its teachings and presenting them than the Catholic Church has. Mind you, the people like Lorna and LSM and others, it's kind of catching up quite fast. But the Orthodox Church say our relationship with nature is that we are all the priests of nature. And our role, as a true role of a priest, particularly in the Orthodox Church, is simply yet gloriously to be the, the vessel, the channel for grace. To creation and from creation back to the Creator. So we need to move beyond an instrumental view of, you know, can we save this? coming up with dreadful language like ecosystem deliverables. We should never use a word that hasn't been used in a poem. Because if it isn't good enough for a poem, it means nothing. So we've got to destroy the language which separates us from the rest of creation. We're not apart. What this film is so powerfully about is we are a part of nature. And we are also sacred. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to join this conversation? Is it true? Is it? Yeah. So, so I, this is the first time that I've seen the film. Um, and, well, I thought it was brilliant actually, but I, I was really interested in the storytelling because obviously you started off wanting to make a film that promoted Laudato Si and so how did you move from that to a letter to characters? Can you tell me just a little bit of the development of the storytelling and I suppose it was very important how you found those people so a little bit about that. Uh, sure yeah. Um, if if, if you all have read the Laudato Si you'll know it doesn't have a plot. <laughs> um, and you know, good good stories need a beginning and a middle and an end, and and so we were, you know, that was one of the things that really uh, gave me a sharp and take a breath when I was handed well when I read the Laudato Si for the first time because I'm not Catholic I hadn't read it uh, um, until we started talking about the film and I was my breath was taken away by how uh, you know the content of it and the philosophy of it. And it took me a year, but I think over time, you know, it really has changed my life in, in many ways. But the, the process of, of telling a story about it was very much of, of like, well, what, what, can we, what can we hold on to in, the, in all this philosophy and all this beautiful language? Um, I think the first one was there was an invitation uh, for a dialogue. Um, we were really fascinated by that word, weren't we, uh, the, the, this idea of dialogue. And wondering about this idea that, you know, as, as I said in the film, I might know what I know, but what about what we know? Um, and so the, the idea then popped into my head, I think, was a, initially it was a dialogue with science. And, and our first strap line was, can faith and science together save the world? Um, that was our first sort of motto. And then we moved on from that sort of thinking, well, that's, you know, science isn't really enough because no... Like science, science isn't a person. Science is, as Greg so eloquently puts it, and, and Robin as well. They say science is a toolkit. It's uh, you know, and scientists are people. So um, we then thought, okay, well maybe it's it's this dialogue needs to be with a few others. And I was determined to not have any um, Catholics in it initially, and and um, but then I uh, because I just thought that would be more interesting. Um, but then. I realized I couldn't do it without Lorna. We needed somebody who kind of um, could, I, I suppose, give us an organizing sense of, of how, because we can't just talk to the Pope, we can't just call him up. <laughs> he, um, so um, this dialogue began to take shape and characters started to emerge who um, we, 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 we thought, okay, they should be representative of, but you know, they, they can't be a statistic, right? Like. Poor people. What? 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 Who is that? 
Um, that was a really difficult one, actually, the most difficult one. Um, and when I, I, we'd, we'd originally been looking at Burkina Faso, it became too dangerous there. And then we found someone in uh, Senegal who, um, at the time, he had not even got a birth certificate, let alone a passport. So getting him to the Vatican was a challenge in that um, even his own country wouldn't recognize him. Um, and then uh, voice of indigenous, voice of youth, we just sort of picked these four, but, you know, didn't want too many uh, because it becomes lost. And I think the, the, the it's a little bit like the, the Wizard of Oz. You know, you go off to see the wizard, the Pope, um, and, well, okay, I, I'm just talking Hollywood here, I'm sorry if this offends anybody, uh, but, but just plot lines, right? This is like, you know, screenwriter, you know, see that, okay, how does, what, what movie is this like? Um, so, it, well, it is a bit, yeah, the interesting thing in The Wizard of Oz is that the wizard, it, it, he really can't help you that much. He can give you a great speech, but you have to discover what to do on your own. Um, you know, the cowardly lion, and the, you know, he, has, he discovers that he's got a, a, a courage. And, and the Tin Man has a heart, but he just didn't know it, um, because he would, was labeled as such. And it's that internal journey that I think is the heart of the Laudato Si. And, 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 you know, we gambled, right? We said, okay, we've got this meeting with the Pope. Somehow we pulled it off, and we got all four people there. Um, but then it's like, then what? You know, so they had a chat. But did anything change? Is anything going to change from a chat like that? And, and, and if I'm honest, nothing really, like people were so dumbfounded by meeting the Pope that they, nothing really had changed other than they had just sort of kind of like, oh, what happened? Oh my God, that was so exciting. <laughs> um, so we had this other kind of harebrained idea, which was mainly me feeling guilty as dragging these people out and making them spend 10 days in quarantine for one day in, in Rome. Uh, I thought, okay, we've got to give them a treat. So let's go to Assisi and dig a little bit deeper. And I think Assisi then suddenly became, and this is the great thing about documentaries, you never expect what's going to happen. But the truth is, is that on any given day, and we could do that for today, we could do it for tomorrow, on any given day, you can look around the world and somewhere something's happening with climate change, some sort of tragedy. And it just so happened that on the day that we were meeting the Pope, of four people, one, actually two, because there was quite a lot going on in Brazil at the time. Um, but certainly, on the day that we were meeting the Pope, um, we were on our way to Assisi, and we get this phone call. Uh, I, well, I, we, we, uh, Aruna gets these sort of texts and phone calls, and they're suddenly saying, we gotta go, we can't stay, we have to go back to Senegal. And we, we can't, like, like we couldn't turn the ship around, it was like really difficult. I said, can you just please stay f for just this meeting? Um, but they, they're, for Aruna, his, his world had bottomed out. Um, and, uh, and, and for Isa, his mentor. And then you suddenly have what I perceive as, as like magic, is that we have a, a reason to come together. We have a, an emotional connection we have a, a, a meeting of minds, and it isn't just the, the, the conversation that was meant to be with the Pope, it was really the conversation was with us. That's what we discovered. And I think that the deeper message of a dialogue, I mean, we were lucky, let's, say, let's face it, usually a dialogue, you have to be in dialogue for some time, maybe a month or something, before something profound might happen. And we were really, really lucky in that we went to that magical forest uh, where Apparently, Lorna will tell you, often magical things happen in the forest above Assisi. Um, and there, I mean, there's a moment there where we were crying, and I remember looking up, and, and again, forgive me, I'm not religious, but Cantal Mesa told me about this thing called the, the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. And he describes it in his book about it's carried in the wind. And there was a moment of silence after we'd heard the news and we were all crying and no one knew what to say and the wind was blowing. And I think at that point we realized that something was speaking through us. We had that moment and that we had a story and we had 
uh, a film, basically. That's for me as a filmmaker. We, you kind of walk away going, my goodness, <laughs> there's, there's, something, there's something very powerful here because what was an idea, you know, kind of a harebrained idea of bringing four people together, um, really happened in a, in a profound way and in many ways is perhaps, the, for me, the, the deeper message. I, I see the Laudato Si as a self-help book and I see it about, um, it's about communication and dialogue between people and the gift that we have and the hope that we find, I think, is in meeting each other. And as the Pope says, we're a, a human family facing an existential crisis. We will figure this out. It may be difficult to figure it out uh, quickly and, you know, flying is not going to go away right away, but somebody somewhere Maybe in this room, a young person's going to find a, a fuel that doesn't uh, that, that holds an airplane aloft but doesn't burn as much carbon dioxide. Who knows? But that's the intention is 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 the you know the glue. Yeah. Thank you. That's beautiful. I could be filled with despair and hopelessness as I watched the film. But as we continue the conversation here together, I have a very strong sense that as we go forward, if we truly want change and transformation, it will happen through dialogue, through conversations, through openness. As some one of you said a few moments ago, we have to make a big shift, some of us have, from seeing the world as us in control to realizing that we are in close relatedness with the earth. We are equal. There is, we just are all different, equal, not, nothing superior. All beings are. And I think if we can come from that, if we move into that awareness of who we are in relation to the world, then our behaviors will change. But the despair will come for, I think, if I work out of the same paradigm that I always was in and continue to be frustrated. But the real hope came in the last, in the last part that you shared with us, meeting with people, trusting that dialogue will open doors. And if we truly want to bring about change in our world, that is the way forward, I think. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, I think one of the things that strikes me about Laudato Si most deeply is where it says, where Pope Francis says rather, that at the heart of the ecological crisis is a deep spiritual crisis. And in order to address the ecological crisis, we have to deal with what's going on in our own hearts. And even the scientists will say, we can't do that. No one was ever converted by a pie chart, as someone here might have said at some point, was it you? <laughs> um, so for my role in Trokra, and it's becoming more and more clear to me that the role of faith communities is this work to create spaces for that dialogue to happen, to create spaces for the movement of hearts that is needed. And that is the work of faith communities where people are thinking about their values, their culture, what's important to them, who they are in their hearts, um, that we are created beings at one with nature, not set apart from it. And I think that's really the role of the church communities in the context that I work. And just to give you an example, there's 220,000 Catholic parishes in the world. What if we all got on board here? That would make such a difference and then take that in across all the other faiths faith groups of the world so i think we've a huge role to play in this and um, to create those spaces for these conversations to happen to think about our faith and our relationship with creation and um, and we see that happening kind of sprinkling around the country this year and the season of creation which has grown from strength to strength year to year things like the data sea week and now we have the gift of this beautiful movie, which we're taking on the road around the country, <laughs> beginning really this week. Um, and I think it's just hugely exciting that we're going to have these conversations in lots of different places this year, thanks to 
uh, Nicholas and his team and, and everyone here. So that's what gives hope and that's what helps us to deal with the anxiety that people are feeling um, and it also keeps us nourished and sustained within it um, that we, we begin at the heart centre and um, once we get that in place everything else flows out of that, the action will flow, we don't need to worry about it because people, um, people will be acting from, from their hearts, doing what is right where they can um, and the last thing in the data see that I'll, I'll share with you is Pope Francis says everyone's gifts and talents are needed to address the damage uh, done by us to our common home. So that no matter where you find yourself, whatever network you're in, whatever community you're in, whatever your gifts are, each of us work out of that and we're all part of the solution. Thank you, Jane. I might just ask you, just, just to add one last thing, absolutely, that, that conviction from the heart, but what Laura and I also work on <clears throat> in our day job when we've got time and we're not helping Nicholas make his films um, is that the face of great stakeholders in the planet we are probably the fourth largest investing group in the world we run a third so we run a half of all schools around the world not just the Catholic, every major faith a third of all universities a third of all medical facilities we own probably outright about 8 to 9 percent of the habitable surface of the planet. We supply half a billion meals a day. We're consumers, we're purchasers, we're investors. And we've got to make that link that Jane has spoken about, about the personal conviction and commitment to the fact that actually, if the faiths really moved, we could change the economy. If the face really moved, we could change the kind of education we do. So that's absolutely, as Jane says, that's what we can ask for. That our faiths are consistent in their teachings and what they do. As actually stakeholders in the planet. But stakeholders who have a very different view of why we are here and what that planet is, which is the gift of God. But we are the stakeholders as well. Martin. I think there's somebody else with a hand up, was there? Yeah. Caroline. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just um, um, think, uh, <coughs> start by thinking of how we uh, respect nature and how uh, we uh, have uh, give nature rights. So, this, this really came up this week because the Biodiversity uh, Citizens Assembly, I, I don't know if anybody heard, but they uh, have decided that uh, biodiversity should be put to a vote that we um, may actually put it into our constitution that, that uh, nature actually will have, have, uh, have rights. And this, this goes to think of other, you know, indigenous people through the ages have, have uh, think of the Native Americans and, and, and other people have, have given space and uh, given nature that um, respect and uh, I, I think maybe that's where, where we're going to make progress. Maybe, maybe Laura. Laura, exactly. Laura, Laura seems like the answer. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I have the answers, <laughs> um, but I, I do think, you know, I've learned so much today, and I, I really feel awed to be sitting up here with <laughs> the people that made the movie, um, and I guess I don't know, Caroline, if I can answer your question specifically, but what I feel, and like I can see so many people in the room here today who are working on this story okay so and the dialogue and the vision and it's those it's the future so there's so much despair and i was really taken by the when you said the word or the, the language we use needs to be um 
fit for a poem. So today I left early this morning, I went out to Thurlis and we were doing a workshop on the local authority climate action plan and we were talking about words like adaptation and mitigations and SWOT analysis and none of the words would fit into a poem. <laughs> um, and, and it was good and it, like so all local authorities now have to do a climate action plan and I think you know what we were talking about is these SWOT analysis but instead of just looking within the local authority that we have dialogue but from the very beginning with our, our communities and I think maybe that's Caroline where where we can so there is the national climate action plan and there is biodiversity plans and that but really it's hard for us to relate to national where it's easy for us to relate to local and I think particularly in the last two years so much has happened well in the last three years in the world but in Mayo in relation to, to climate action there's been a real coming together of community groups um, and so we have another not very poet or poem friendly word is decarbonisation zones um, which is a really unfortunate word because what we have now our communities, there's 10 communities in Mayo that um, went through this process and they've created a vision of where they would like their community to be in 2030. And I remember reading the visions and like nearly crying because they were so simple and so beautiful. And it was because when, and I think COVID maybe real, made us realize this, that we, when once we pause and once we, take the time that we can walk and we can talk to our neighbours and we can listen to the birds and we can be be part of nature. So there are these communities in Mayo that have put together these visions and that are very definitely action in these visions, but it did kind of begin begin with the dialogue. And I think that's maybe where we as a local authority, we need to be doing things and approaching things differently. And so we do have to do the climate action plans next year, but it won't be a public con consultation once we have it all drafted. It'll be us engaging with you, the community, from the very beginning so that we can do this using the hope, because it is despair, but we need people to have hope and to, to outline these beautiful futures that we can have. But um, we're running out of time, so we do need to, need to get working on it pretty, pretty fast. <laughs> Okay, we're coming to the end. So, if there's anybody, anybody else? else who has anything they'd like to, this gentleman up there, Breed, just up halfway. Yeah. With reference to the, the speaker and the local community, I think it is. Um, never thought that we were going through my mind the stakeholder idea and the stewardship. And I, and I, I find it so impressive here, the echo congregation and work that they're doing. And being here, I suppose, as one of the priests in the parish from 1970 to 93, I saw where the local authority at the time, the local urban council, was so supportive to so many voluntary groups, and uh, particularly the uh, Tidy Towns and Westport has a lot of achievement in that. And of course the beauty of nature around us and Pro Patrick and all the whole setting is is uh, is a you know that creates that sense of wonder and appreciation and gratitude for the beauty of nature around us and kind of whole question for conservation. But listening to the community groups need support. And they need a structural support and they need statutory recognition because and um, with great respect to what well, the political systems is it his but the fact is that I've been away from Westport for 20 years and coming back in more recent times the lack of the local statutory body which is the urban council I think has a huge deteriorating effect on so much within our community in terms of voluntary groups, support that was given, the local interaction between people who are representing the community in a statutory body, and that had some strength and had good support as well, I must say, at the time. 
in the structure that was there from, say, the Mayo County Council. But I think that so much we're talking about, unless it has a structure that is politically supportive to the whole challenge that we face about the universe and about climate change and interaction with that, that people really can feel disempowered. And that is one of the things that I feel concerned about, is the disempowerment that can be there, where there isn't a local statutory body supporting the voluntary groups in so many different areas, and especially those who are involved in conserving the uh, world as, as it is and preserving the planet. It's just a thought, I'm just see this here, and I think that there is a political dimension that needs to be anchored in local communities where I don't know what size it would be raised, but certainly the loss of that statutory body in this community has had a huge deteriorating effect on so many things. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm just adding a bit because I do have exciting news on that front. Um, so finally, the government have recognised that there does need to be staff employed on climate action. So every local authority, as well ideally before Christmas, but I don't think it's going to happen before Christmas, the government are now going to pay for a climate action coordinator, a climate action officer, and a community climate action officer. So this community climate action officer, in the case of Mayo, will have €609,000 to distribute to, to community groups, and this is, is part of a national fund. There will also be, there's 12 new biodiversity officers started this year, so there'll be more again in, in 2023. So. Mayo should hopefully have a, because a, a, currently we have a heritage officer and she has to do everything in heritage and biodiversity, but there will be a heritage officer as well and there is energy officers to be put in place in every local authority where there aren't some. So it doesn't answer all the questions and we definitely need more political buy-in. I do think that from conversations that our local politicians are when they're hearing from their communities because even prior to the last elections, you know, they'd be saying, you know, climate change, we don't hear it on the doorstep. But over the last year, and again, kind of back to those community groups, they're going and they're presenting to their local council, and the council can no longer say that we're not hearing about climate change from our, our voters. So um, it, they're all very valid points, um, and hopefully there will be positive action on, on that. Thanks, Laura. And just to say, I don't know if any of our local politicians are here. I don't think I see any, but they were all invited. So, <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> Michelle, yeah. Hello, just um, following on two points that uh, bring in politics and dialogue that change comes about through dialogue. Watching the film, I really enjoyed the spectacular filming of nature. I mean, that's just always such a joy. Um, but I always, I also found that at times, I like in a documentary where my mind just follows little tangents. So, for example, the man in the Amazon, his anger at the companies cutting down the forest. That, Anyway, let me continue. And then the, the Pope, um, it just sort of slipped by, but he was speaking, I think it was in a, a different segment, but he was speaking about very political stuff, about um, social justice, capitalism, um, and then you went to Assisi and the notion of choosing poverty. Um, and then one little image has stuck with me, the little part of where we see the flooded school and the floor is completely littered with bloody plastic. And I thought that's coming in from the Atlantic, that's probably big waves washed that in, I have no idea. So can you envisage dialogue with the beef barons, with the petrochemical companies? Like I know this, the local stuff is important, but can they be engaged to um, see the consequences? Um, of what 
I think, I mean, I, this is a fantastic discussion and every time I've, we've shown the film anywhere, it's like we could stay here all night and because we're just getting into the meat of the discussion now. Um, and obviously, I mean, I just, I worked for nearly 20 years with Chokra's Head of Advocacy and Campaigning um, and we need to raise our voices. I think there's, like, motivated by love, motivated by a righteous anger at what's happening to our world, we need to raise our voices because it's not right. How is it possible that there was the COP, the climate negotiations in Sharon El Sheikh, two weeks ago, that were pretty much hijacked by a fossil fuel lobbyists, 600 lobbyists from the fossil fuel industry. Uh, uh, the global, in the middle of this global crisis, it's, not, it's just not, not right. So we do have voices and there are many organisations, including Chokra, Friends of the Earth, um, the Laudato Sea Movement is a global network of organisations that we can, we can campaign together for change and show our local um, TDs, our local councillors, there's fantastic work now starting to go on at the local level, but it has to start. It, I mean, one of the challenges we face in Ireland is just that there's so many burning issues. Um, so the housing issue, and but at the end of the day, they all have a similar root, which is really the dominance of uh, finance and the financialization of, of our planet, of our world. The Pope was touching on that when he talked too, and we have to say, no, it's, it's not right. Nature has rights. People have human rights, the right to house, the right to, to a livelihood. But I think that the more people we can put this film in front of, the better. I'll just tell one very short story. We showed it in London. Uh, we had a conference uh, with Faith Invest. Many big financiers, different faith organisations who have substantial investments. And there was one particular uh, man spoke at it who manages a significant a fund in the, the US and um, you would think on behalf of a, a Christian church and you would think that um, they would have a really good sense of the, the need to care for creation also through how they invest. He was moved to tears watching the film, absolutely had a, he called it a road to Damascus experience. And afterwards, in, in the pub with me, had to be in the pub with me, uh, having a chat about the film, trying to you know, unpack how he was feeling, we talked a lot about the fact that the, the fund that he manages had no screens on it. So it was just invested in the, the stock exchange. So I was like, well, you're in, that's investing in the, what's currently happening in the logging destruction and whatever. And he was like, but we're talking to those companies and they're telling us that they're pretty much, they're doing good stuff and they're talking to the communities. And I was like, well, I'll tell you some stories. And I told them stories working with Chokra and going to the gold mines in Honduras and visiting the so-called communities that the, the gold company, the Canadian gold company, was helping. And it was like the scales falling from this gentleman's eyes. Because... When you're so wrapped up in your world of high finance, never having to step outside that reality, it's very easy to take the words at face value. But those kind of, we need to get people to see this film to really, to start to have a wake up call about the reality of what's happening. But also then to really campaign and to uh, make people see, especially our, our churches, you, you can't be investing in the destruction of the planet. It's just not. It's immoral. It has to change. All it took was one person to change. Mm. We are not actually dealing with massive monsters that have no heart. Mm. We're dealing with organisations that have a lot of very good people in them. Mm -hmm. But as Lorna said, who live in a silo. And you can attack them, but that usually means they draw up the drawbridges. Or you can engage with them. And I've worked multi-faith all my life. 
Dialogue's fine. The dialogue often avoids confrontation or exploration of really difficult issues. And I've been at so many interfaith events where, frankly, you know, it was nice and we had tea, <laughs> but that was about it. Um, dialogue has actually got to have some grit in it. Otherwise, it just becomes being nice. And what happened with this particular man was, he came, we were nice, and then we put some grit in his machine. And then we showed him a film, and he wept. So it's not that we're dealing with invisible forces of, of, of malevolence. We're dealing mostly with ignorance and isolation and fear. And as people of faith, we ought to be able to handle that. Sorry, I think we have to finish. Oh yeah, Lorna or Jane. Jane was going to cut it. Just want to finish with. As you came in, hopefully you all received a postcard. No. Oh, they are here. You will shortly receive a postcard. Don't leave without it. So this is Pope Francis's letter to you. And there's a QR code on the postcard or a website to look up. The letterfilm.org will bring you to the website of the movie. And I just ask everyone here to think about where might you show this movie next. And then you can get in touch with me and Trokra and we'll help you to make that happen. And on the back, there's a couple of questions for you. Something you might do in your personal life as a result of seeing this movie. And something you might do in your parish community or your community where you hang out or your circle of influence as a result of seeing this movie and dream big and thank you very much and take a postcard home. Take it home. Yes, take it home with you. Don't leave it here. Stick it on your fridge. Somewhere you'll see it um, every day. Thank you. Around the other side. Okay. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you very much. That has been the most inspiring evening and most heartful evening that I've had in a long time. Thank you very much. And just to remind you all, um, apart from from this wonderful film tonight, we are a small little group here on the ground in Westport, doing the little bit we can to raise awareness around these kind of issues. And we're always delighted to have people join us in Westport Eagle Congregation. So if you'd like to get involved, just talk to one of us here and give us your name, your telephone number and your email address. And we'd love to be in touch with you. Okay, so again, just thank you very much. We start with Lorna. Lorna, Jane, Laura, Martin and, Martin and Nicholas. And we finish with Nicholas. And thank you for that amazing film. It's absolutely beautiful. Thank you all. Thank you.